Day 58 of the war with Hamas with heavy fighting underway inside the Gaza Strip. The fighting in Gaza renewed Friday morning since Hamas violated the temporary truce. Airstrikes hit over 400 terror targets with the IDF warning civilians to move to designated areas. More from ILTV's Steve Leibowitz. Since early Friday morning, the IDF renewed the offensive in Gaza after an eight-day truce. Air Force and artillery carried out extensive airstrikes hitting over 400 terror targets in Gaza since the renewal of fighting. The Army is telling Gazan civilians to move to designated safe zones ahead of planned advances of troops on the ground in northern Gaza, indicating that ground operations in the southern part of the Strip were due to start soon. Gazans reported the IDF had dropped flyers in Khan Yunus, calling on residents to move south to Rafah, warning that the area is now dangerous. The airstrikes are focused in the Khan Yunus area, where many Hamas leadership are believed to be hiding in underground tunnels. Several terror cells were eliminated and targets hit, included an ammunition depot. Hamas rocket fire into Israel has been sporadic. At least 10 rockets were fired during a barrage toward the coastal plain. The rockets were intercepted and shot down over central Israel. A man in Cholon was hurt by shrapnel from a rocket barrage. There was heavy shelling into Gazan border communities with material damages at Kibbutz Mifalsim, near the border with the northern Gaza Strip. Meanwhile, the IDF announced that the head of the army brigade on the Gaza border was murdered during the Hamas massacres on October 7th, and his body is held by Hamas in Gaza. Colonel Asaf Hamami, age 41, the commander of the Gaza Division's Southern Brigade, was recognized as a fallen soldier held by the terrorist group. Looking north, the relative eight days of calm on the Lebanese border ended as soon as the Hamas violated the truce in Gaza. Rockets were fired from Lebanon at army posts along the border near Roshanikra and Margaliot. An Iron Dome shot down two missiles fired toward the city of Kiryat Shmona. Hezbollah claimed responsibility for the cross-border attacks after pausing fire during the eight-day truce with Hamas. In retaliation, the IDF carried out airstrikes and artillery shelling against Hezbollah sites in southern Lebanon. The IDF struck a terrorist cell in south Lebanon close to the northern community of Zarit as a fighter jet, combat helicopter, and artillery struck the Hezbollah stronghold. They deny the kidnapping of our children, the murder of our grandchildren, the rape of our daughters. The new Nazis we face today will stop at nothing to destroy civilization as we know it. The World Jewish Congress was created exactly for these times like this. So every Jew will fall asleep at night knowing they are safe in their own home. We are a voice for the Jewish people everywhere. We are the World Jewish Congress. Well, as the IDF continues to strike terrorist targets in Gaza as well as in Syria and Lebanon, over 100 hostages remain in the Gaza Strip, held by Hamas. Here to speak with us about the return to conflict in Gaza after the temporary pause in fighting, as well as the hostage crisis, is Ruth Wasserman Landy, former member of Knesset and a Middle East foreign policy expert. Ruth, thanks so much for joining us. Let's start off with the end of the ceasefire. Some are criticizing Israel over returning to conflict, but this only occurred, as we know, after Hamas fired rockets. Who is to blame for this breakdown of the ceasefire, and why is the blame falling on Israel? So according to uh, the information that we have, uh, the negotiations for the hostage release, um, providing the actual temporary um, ceasefire, uh, sort of uh, that was stuck. Uh, the mediators felt it. Uh, the Hamas said it. Um, they also made declarations about the uh, rest of the hostages uh, would be released after the war is over, according to them. And they sort of said again and again that they don't have any more women and children, even though there are two more children held uh, hostage uh, by the Hamas uh, operatives and the terrorists. And, of course, we have a list of women that were abducted, uh, and uh, God only knows what they had suffered in uh, captivity. So that was what had uh, caused the return to the fighting. Now, what is the longer-term strategy here? I mean, the IDF wants to eliminate Hamas, but 
Will that actually resolve the problem in Gaza? And why or why not? So first of all, without any doubt whatsoever, uh, the Hamas is a terrorist organization holding captive, first and foremost, the civilian population within Gaza and also uh, hundreds of Israeli civilians, and not only Israelis, but foreign nationals that have absolutely nothing to do even with this region. Uh, Second of all, they continued for years and years to throw rockets at Israeli civilian population centers. Um, There is no country in the entire universe that would have um, succumbed to this kind of a reality without any kind of response Uh, and uh, living side by side with an entity that does all of that not to mention the heinous crimes and crimes against humanity that were perpetrated on October 7 and the continuation of the rocket firing is absolutely unheard of. All of this together actually combines with the declared motivation of the Hamas that says clearly, without any doubt, and any Westerner that refuses to listen to it, it's beyond actually my comprehension. In fact, it is so difficult to comprehend and to internalize the evil nature of this regime that even Israel had difficulty in really believing until October 7th that it was capable of such atrocities. But finally, we understood that what Hamas declares, i.e., that it wants to end the existence of the state of Israel and to kill every single Israeli citizen from the river to the sea, that is its motivation. And that's not enough. They also declare that they want to kill every single Jew on the face of the planet. And after that, they will begin to kill the infidels, i.e. all of those who do not believe in Islam. I think it's high time that we believe them. What is Israel's strategy to to rescue the remaining hostages and, and how likely are we to succeed in this mission? So, you know, Emily, um, Israel sanctifies life. Uh, Therefore, it is very sensitive. The entire society is uh, deeply touched and uh, is mourning every single uh, citizen and uh, soldier that uh, that either dies or is held captive, uh, either uh, alive or even uh, dead. We sanctify life. We value each and every person uh, in our society. And therefore, when the government of Israel says that it will do everything, everything in its power to get our civilians back, I sincerely believe that that is exactly what will happen with information, with intelligence, and unfortunately, because we know our enemy, we know how it plays. Ruth, we're out of time, but thank you so much for joining us today. Gave us a lot to think about in these uh, difficult days ahead, for sure. Good evening. The U.S. blamed Hamas for the end of the eight-day pause in Gaza fighting. U.S. Secretary of State Blinken said Hamas began firing rockets at Israel before the truce officially ended early Friday morning. Washington and Qatar are reportedly still working on a potential further hostage exchange, but Israel insists that future exchanges will happen only under fire. More from ILTV's Steve Leibowitz. Israel ordered the head of the Mossad to return from Qatari-led mediation talks after efforts to extend the truce reached a dead end. Each day of the seven-day truce, Hamas needed to provide names and release 10 Israeli women and children hostages. Israel halted the fire and also released three Palestinian security prisoners for each Israeli hostage released. The White House placed the blame for the renewed fighting on Hamas, but also said the U.S. was continuing to work with Israel, Egypt and Qatar to try to restart the truce for hostage deal. Israel is insisting that any future hostage releases will be conducted with the war ongoing and no more pause in fighting until Hamas is defeated in Gaza. Washington also emphasized that civilians in Gaza must be protected during renewed fighting. Israel said that would be the case, as was done until now. I made clear that before Israel resumes major military operations, 
it must put in place humanitarian and civilian protection plans that minimize further casualties of innocent Palestinians. קובעים כל הזמן בתיאום, בתיאום עם גורמים בינלאומיים וגם בתיאום עם ידידינו האמריקנים. אנחנו קווים אזורים בטוחים שהאוכלוסייה יודעת שהיא יכולה להתפנות לשם. עשינו את זה בצפון ואנחנו עושים את זה, נעשה את זה גם בזירות אחרות. זה חשוב לעשות כי יש לנו, אין לנו שום רצון לפגוע באוכלוסייה. יש לנו רצון להימנע מפגיעה באוכלוסייה, יש לנו רצון עז מאוד The truce lasted seven days, beginning last Friday, November 24th, with the first release of a group of hostages after some 50 days in Hamas captivity, and broke down a week later with the resumption of fighting. During the truce, 105 civilians were released from Gaza, including 81 Israelis, 23 Thai nationals, and one Filipino, in exchange for 210 Palestinian security prisoners, all of them women or minors. Israel also allowed in an influx of humanitarian aid into the Gaza Strip. Experience the power of truth with ILTV News. If you're looking for quality content and captivating visuals, join our news community and become an integral part of our team as we embark on a mission to unveil the real Israel, dismantling the web of lies and misinformation that surround reporting on Israel. By subscribing to ILTV News, you will not only have access to the latest updates, but you will also amplify our message, creating a ripple effect that carries the truth far and wide. Subscribe today and help reshape the narrative, available on the web, Android, and Apple. As the Gaza war rages on, over 100 hostages are still in Gaza, including women, children, and elderly. As stories are beginning to come out about the treatment of hostages during their time in captivity, pressure is increasing to bring them all home. ILTV's William Sharon has the latest. Last night, tens of thousands of Israelis gathered with the families of the remaining hostages in Gaza to demand their immediate release. While the past week saw a temporary pause in fighting and the return of dozens of hostages, this week the truce was suspended after Hamas fired rockets at Israeli civilians, ending the ceasefire. Though 137 hostages remain in Gaza, and 126 of them Israelis, Prime Minister Netanyahu ordered Mossad Chief David Balner to return from Qatar, where truce negotiations were taking place after the Hamas escalations. As the 86 Israeli hostages who were released began to speak out, the urgency is growing for the remaining hostages to come home due to the inhuman conditions for the hostages in Gaza. Reports from returned Israeli hostages indicate shocking conditions and abuse by Hamas as well as a refusal to give medication to hostages or allow visits from the Red Cross. Among those still in Gaza is the youngest hostage, a 10-month-old baby, Phil Bibas, along with his four-year-old brother, Ariel, and his parents. Last night, tens of thousands gathered in Tel Aviv with the families of the remaining hostages demanding all remaining hostages be released. Despite the urgency, the families of the hostages are not calling for a ceasefire. Rather, they are seeking answers for Israel's strategy to bring their loved ones home. Well, Israel has begun to consider plans for Gaza after the defeat of Hamas. The U.S. has been putting forward some ideas on its own. Here from ILTV's Steve Leibowitz. Israel has reportedly told the U.S. and Arab states of plans to create a Gaza buffer zone along the border after the defeat of Hamas. The buffer zone is aimed at preventing future terror attacks like the October 7th onslaught. Washington has insisted that Gaza territory cannot be reduced. Buffer zone, let me be clear. Uh, you won't have a situation in the future where you can have Hamas uh, terrorists on the border, directly on the border, positioned just to cross over and kill our people again. There will have to be security arrangements on the ground to prevent that from happening. Washington has its own ideas about Gaza after the war. The two allies have conflicting views on the future role of the Palestinian Authority and the future of the region. Five principles guide our approach for post-conflict Gaza. No forcible displacement, no reoccupation, no siege or blockade, no reduction in territory, and no use of Gaza as a platform for terrorism. We want to see a unified Gaza and West Bank under the Palestinian Authority. Prime Minister Netanyahu has said repeatedly that the Palestinian Authority is part of the problem and cannot be part of the solution. Israeli officials maintain that Israel will retain 
overall security control in Gaza after the war. Please note that the following may be triggering for some viewers. It's been two months since the shocking events of October 7th, which included the rape and sexual assault of Israeli women and girls by Hamas terrorists. Yet, for the UN women, apparently, that's not enough to warrant an investigation or even a statement. See, in the weeks following the October 7th massacre, UN women issued a statement about the status of Palestinian women, with no mention whatsoever of the brutal sexual assault as a method of war carried out by Hamas terrorists. Now, after two months, they issued a statement about the situation in Gaza, which discussed how all women should be protected, which, of course, is true. But it isn't Palestinian women and girls being gang-raped and murdered by Hamas terrorists. Now, it's true. The UN Women's Statement included two sentences about how they unequivocally condemn the rape of Israeli women. But you can't unequivocally condemn when the message of your entire statement is equivocating and politicizing rape. Instead of coming out with an actual unequivocal condemnation, the UN Women responded to sexual violence against Israeli women by speaking about all women. This is pure disrespect and minimizes the scope of the problem. All women were not targeted by Hamas terrorists with the backing of the misogynist Islamic regime in Iran. All women were not sexually mutilated, gang-raped, tortured, and shot in the head while being raped by Hamas. All women were not assaulted so violently that they had broken pelvises. All that happened to Israeli women. Don't Israeli women deserve a statement of their own, unequivocally condemning Hamas's sexual violence without dragging in political conflicts? UN Women, you cannot call yourself pro-women when you minimize and ignore sexual violence against Israeli women. And now shifting over to the UK, where a rally is taking place protesting against the UN women for their 57-day failure to condemn Hamas sexual violence against women. ILTV's Ariella Lahiani is on the ground reporting on this event, as well as the ongoing issue of anti-Semitism in the UK. Ariella, you're in London now, where women are marching in protest of the UN taking 57 days to condemn Hamas. What can you tell us about what's going on? Um, well, today's march is a little bit different to other ones that we've seen, predominantly because this couldn't be a march where there are two sides. It's not a march whether you're pro-Israel or pro-Palestine. This is a march uh, for women, and so women's rights and equality of women, wherever you come from, uh, whatever your religion is, whatever your race is, whatever your beliefs are, uh, that women deserve rights. Hundreds of the people have come today, not only women, men are here, and not only Jews are here, um, many people from different groups have shown up uh, to stand in solidarity with the women who have been affected and demand those rights. Uh, professors, the Deputy Mayor of Jerusalem is here speaking behind me just now. Um, so it's a good turnout and it's, it's a really important cause. And how has the atmosphere at the march been specifically? How does it contrast with the, you know, anti-Israel protests um, you've been seeing in London? It's different for the same reasons I said before. It's different to any protest, really, because it's this isn't about choosing a side. This is a time when all sides should come together because it's not about belief that women, regardless of where you're from, deserve a right. And rape is rape. It doesn't matter if you're Jewish, Muslim, Christian... Buddhist, rape is rape, um, and we need to see more objection to anyone who refuses to, uh, to practice that. Ariella, thank you for joining us. For years, the Arava and Eshkol regions have shared a close bond. So when Eshkol families were forced to evacuate after the October 7th attacks, Arava community members opened their homes without hesitation. Decades of friendship cultivated through Jewish National Fund USA partnerships blossomed into extraordinary hospitality. Already by October 10th, the region formed an alternative educational frame throughout all seven of the Yeshuvim. Now joining us in studio to discuss these incredible partnerships is Noah Zer, Resource Development Director for the Arava region. Noah, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, just to start off, can you tell us more about the role of JNF USA in developing this educational oasis? 
So we've been working with the, the Jewish National Fund USA for many years. And right when uh, Black Sabbath happened, we picked up the phone and said, we need to take care of the children. And immediately after two hours, we got the green light to start forming an educational framework for the children. We're talking about 600 children that came all the way from their homes to the Arava. And we started working in the Yeshuvim, in the Moshevim at first, and then uh, forming a school, a regional school for them in one of our communities. Now, what were the biggest priorities and considerations when you were conceiving and, of course, creating this sort of specialized school system for the evacuees? Well, we realized that, that the most important thing for kids is the stability. They need to have a, a stable framework. They need to be in an environment that can give them whatever they need. And we really wanted to form something right away and to make sure that they'll work, wake up in the morning, go to school, and have some sort of a normal routine as possible. It's an anchor in their very messed up life right now that is very important to their, to their well-being. Well, I wanted to ask you, just as a follow-up to that, how important is this, this sense of normalcy that, that children need in, in these kind of situations for the evacuees specifically? I mean, these are some of the children who had family members, who had friends that were actually murdered in the October 7th attack. So how important is this sense of normalcy when it comes to education? We're talking about kids that usually need a sense of uh, routine for their well-being. That's what keeps them um, active. And this is, these are kids that their entire world have collapsed. Nothing in their life is not stable anymore. Not their parents, not their natural environment, nothing is stable. So to have that island or oasis where they can be just kids going to school just as any other normal kid, it's more than the schooling. It's to meet up their friends, is to be with their teachers. We even brought their security guards from their original schools. Mm -hmm. So they'll have some sort of a duplication of their former lives. And that was so important for them. So what are you seeing now? You know, how does it feel to see these, these students learning together in this kind of environment facilitated by JNF uh, USA's project? And what have, if there have been any yet, uh, what have the challenges been for these kids? About the challenges that the kids are having, there are so many. And together with Jewish National Fund USA, we're not just giving the educational framework, but also the emotional support and the psychological support that the kids need. Not just the kids, by the way, the, the teachers are also their own teachers who need also guidance and they need support. And um, so the challenges are multiple, but we try to address each and every challenge in our own way. And the first thing is really to bring them together in a school with teachers that they know, with uh, their friends that they haven't seen. You know, the Alva is so big, they're scattered across the Moshevin, and all of a sudden they see familiar faces. It provides a sense of I would say comfort and, and some sort of stability that they need. And to see kids just being kids, just playing you know, soccer during the recess time, it's that joy that they are missing and the ability to just be a child going to school just as any other kid or just as their former life. It's a few hours where they don't need to think about anything but just being kids again. Mm -hmm. And that is the most important thing. Absolutely. Well, I want to thank you and JNF USA for that important work that you're doing. Uh, we are out of time, but thank you so much for joining us, Noah, and please keep up the good work. Thank you. Let's take a look at the weather forecast. Mostly cloudy skies expected tonight around the country with lows of 11 degrees Celsius or 52 degrees Fahrenheit. Then tomorrow, more cloudy skies and cold temperatures set to reach highs of only 22 degrees Celsius or 72 degrees Fahrenheit. That's all for today's news. For more updates from Israel on all your devices, check out our ILTV channels, subscribe to our ILTV newsletter, and don't forget to check out our new and improved website, ILTV.tv, with all the latest news from the heart of the state of Israel. I'm Emily Schrader. Be well, and thank you so much for watching.